How do you protect your invention idea? This video is going to give you everything you need to know about protecting ideas and inventions. And the first thing you're probably going to think about is, well, I want to be protective of, of things because I don't want to lose patent rights or I don't want somebody to steal my idea. But almost as importantly is being overprotective, which can cause you, you cause your business to fail just as much as losing your rights does. So stick around. We are starting right now. <laughs> So for those of you who are new here, my name is Dylan Adams. I am a patent attorney and author of the best-selling book, Patents Demystified, which is an insider's guide to protecting ideas and inventions used by inventors, entrepreneurs, and startups worldwide, including at top universities like Harvard, Stanford, and MIT. You might also recognize me for my appearance on CNBC's hit show, The Profit with Marcus Limonis. This channel is all about giving you insider tips and uh, tricks on protecting ideas and inventions, so be sure to subscribe and click the little bell icon so you don't miss any important videos on patents and startups. All right, let's go ahead and get right into it. So when it comes to protecting an invention idea, the first thing you may think about is preventing others from stealing your idea, and that is certainly a consideration in early stages. But I also want you to consider protecting yourself from inadvertently losing your patent rights, which can totally torpedo a business before you even get off the ground. That's another sort of protection. Additionally, down the road, when you uh, bring a product to market, how are you going to prevent other people from uh, knocking that off and, and actually doing that idea when it's actually uh, a product? How are you going to prevent people from doing that? Additionally, how are you going to prevent other people from patenting your idea? Um, whether or not you have it patented yourself. So this video is going to explain all those things. Okay, so let's start with preventing your idea from being stolen by others in early stages. Now, this can be relatively easy. So all you need to do is not disclose the idea to anybody, right? So if nobody else knows about the idea, there's nobody there to, to steal it. Okay, that sounds great in theory, but at the same time, businesses don't do really well if you don't start talking to people about it. You're going to have to work with other people in terms of designing products, doing market testing, and then you're eventually going to have to get the product out there. So how do you go from keeping something secret, how long do you want to keep something secret, to then telling people and who can you trust telling uh, about your idea. Okay, so when it comes to keeping an invention secret, that is important for a couple of reasons. One is obviously because, you know, somebody could theoretically take your idea and they could do it themselves. Although I would say that that's very unlikely typically. Um, but what's very important though is that patent rights actually start to be lost upon a first public disclosure, public use, or offer for sale. And so if you start doing those things, you may actually inadvertently forfeit really important patent rights that may be important to protecting your idea or invention or uh, attracting investors um, or you know selling the company down the road. So that's probably the more important reason why you don't want to make public disclosures, public uses or offer for sale of a product because that can forfeit patent rights unknowingly and then you can totally tor torpedo a business um, before you even get started. You've already forfeited your patent rights. There's no way to get those things back. So when it comes to keeping things secret, I usually suggest that people have an initial period where they keep things as secretive as possible. And that doesn't mean not to tell anybody. In terms of patent rights, as long as there is at least implied confidentiality, you're going to be protected and you're not going to be losing patent rights from a, a public disclosure or, or public use. You know, for instance, like telling your spouse about your idea, that's going to be fine as long as you trust that person. Um, the issue is if you tell other people and they disclose it, that could potentially forfeit patent rights, which is not good. And it allows other people to know about the idea. So, you know, make sure that people understand that this is something that's important to you. They should keep it confidential and potentially have them sign a non disclosure agreement. A lot of times people are really put off by a non disclosure agreement. So, I would say only use that if it's absolutely necessary. Um, you know, it's something that should be used selectively and not necessarily as 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 a default. Again, you know, when it comes to potentially forfeiting patent rights, you know, you don't need to actually have a non-disclosure agreement as long as there's implied confidentiality. But at the same time, you know, I think people should try not to keep something secret all that long. They should try to get it public and start talking to people about it as soon as possible, but do it safely. But before we get there, let's kind of talk about that initial period and what you should be doing while you're keeping things secretive. So the first thing is you want to determine whether your idea is actually going to make a good business. And and I'll tell you, you know, I see a lot of ideas with my clients coming in. You know, they have interesting and clever ideas, but they do the analysis, they do a market analysis and kind of look at, hey, who are the people who are going to be buying this? 
What is the market like? How much can I pr pr produce this for? How am I gonna actually turn this into a product? And they realize that, well, hey, it's a really cool and clever idea, but it's not gonna make a good business or product. And you need to figure that out before you start going on to, to earlier steps. And a lot of times you can do this fairly easily inexpensively if not free and using resources just like doing uh, Google searches or maybe doing confidential uh, discussions with people. So my suggestion here is, you know, do some uh, search of the market, determine who the customers are, figure out if your idea really is going to be a good business. That's the first thing that you should be doing and determine, hey, is this something that people really need? Are they really going to buy? Um, and can I produce it at a price point that people are actually gonna wanna buy it at? Those are all the things you should be doing during this initial confidential period, okay? But when you're ready to start look, looking for investors, actually start talking to customers, doing public disclosures, public uses or offers for sale, you first need to file a patent application. And again, the, the most important thing is because you don't wanna lose your patent rights. Again, patent rights start to be lost upon a first public disclosure, public use or offer for sale. So that's why you need to file a patent application. I usually recommend a provisional patent application because that can be done a lot more cost effectively. It gives you a lot more flexibility than starting off with the non-provisional patent application. And be sure to check out some of our other videos that describe the provisional versus non-provisional patent process and why provisionals are a good way to start. So once you file your first patent application, then you should feel free to talk to people about it openly. You should go and talk to investors openly about it. Um, you should talk to customers about it openly. Um, and, and that's really important. You wanna go from being secretive to then talking about it openly because that's how you learn about the business and about the product. You, you really need to get that feedback. And one of the things that people make a mistake in is in keeping things secretive and not telling any, anybody about it and they never get any feedback and never really are able to develop the product. Um, you don't wanna develop the product in a vacuum. So again, Keep it secretive for as long as possible. Do as much market research as you need to do. Maybe build a prototype and do a lot of that background stuff. Do as much of that as you can, keeping it secretive, and then file a provisional patent application before you're ready to make a first public disclosure, public use, or offer for sale, and then start talking about things openly and publicly. That's when you sort of, tr sort of transition from being uh, secretive to being public about things. So that is, those are gonna be, the, that's the initial stage of protecting your idea or invention. So what about stopping people from copying your product or patenting the product themselves? So you can actually do this kind of through the same thing, and that's through filing a non-provisional patent application. So uh, let me kind of step back and talk about provisional versus non-provisional, just to kind of give you the basics on that, because it's, it's important to understand these two applications and how they fit into the application process and how they can actually give you offensive and defensive protection. Okay, so like I said, I usually recommend that uh, small businesses or startups start with filing a provisional patent application. The provisional patent application only lasts for one year, it expires at the end of the year, and then you have to file what's called a non-provisional patent application. So the non-provisional patent application, that's the one that will actually go through an examination process at the USPTO um, and will hopefully issue as a mat uh, matured and issued patent. Okay, so the not again, the non provisional is the application that waits in line for one to three years. An examination process goes on with the, uh, the examiner, and assuming that uh, what you have is new and non obvious compared to the prior art, the examiner will allow the case, you pay an issue fee, and then the application issues as a patent. Okay, so one of the important things when it comes to defensive protection is getting your patent application published. And some people tend to be hesitant about this. They say, well, I wanna keep things secret and I don't want people to know about it, so I don't want my patent application to publish. So by default, patent applications will publish 18 months from their earliest priority date. So you file a provisional, you file a non-provisional, and then six months from when you file the non-provisional typically, you know, at the 18 month mark from the provisional, that's when the non-provisional patent application will publish. And this is actually a good thing, okay? One is, you know, having that application out there, that's something that looks really good to investors. It's a deterrent for other people. And yes, it gives you details on what you're doing, but at the same time, you know, people are then hesitant to do those things because they know that there is at least a 
a patent application out there on that. So I, I wouldn't be uh, worried about having something published. If anything, there's a lot more benefit to having your patent application published than there is a downside. And one of the most important things is that it actually prevents other people from patenting it. So I talked about the patent examination process where the uh, patent examiner uh, gets your application, they're going to do a prior art search and determine whether what you have is new and non-obvious compared to the prior art. So think about somebody else doing this. So if they were to file a patent application on something that is exactly what you're doing or very similar, they're going to go through an examination process and the examiner is going to say, hey, is what this person has, is it new and non-obvious compared to the prior art? So prior art can really be anything. Um, it could be issued patents, it could be patent publications, but it really could be things like your own product that you've been selling, it could be your website that talks about your product. That could be prior art that's used against their patent application that would allow them to not get a patent, or it may make their patent application have to be really, really narrow so that maybe they would get a patent, but it would be something that's very different than what you have. But the problem though is even though your website and your previous product could theoretically be prior against someone else's patent application on something that's similar, a lot of times patent examiners aren't gonna find those things and they aren't gonna be doing searching that is gonna identify that sort of prior art. The best kind of prior art that you can create is gonna be through a published patent application or an issued patent. And usually, you know, you're not gonna be at the issued patent stage, but you may be at the uh, published patent application stage. And that is gonna be a lot easier for patent examiners to find. So that's another reason why it's important to file a patent application. So it'll publish and be used as prior art against other people who are trying to patent similar things. And I've seen this a lot when it comes to uh, lit litigation cases where people have been selling a product for a long time, but they didn't decide to patent it themselves. They said, ah, we don't really care about patent protection. But then somebody else, and they, they, somebody else goes and patents something that's similar that arguably reads on what they're doing. And even though that other person can say, well, but we were doing this before, um, you know, you know we, we, we have prior art that shows that, you still have to defend against that litigation, which can be expensive. And a lot of times the, the person will say, well, I disagree, I'll see you in court, and they're gonna cost you a lot of money in doing that. The easiest way to prevent issues like that and letting, uh, even though it's invalid, letting a, letting a patent issue on something that's going to cover your product, even though you did it first, is file a patent application and let that patent application issue. Okay, so that's one of the things that people don't really think about. There's that defensive aspect to filing a patent application. The publication gives you a lot of defense. Um, it also gives you defense in terms of the optics. People seeing it and saying, hey, there's something, uh, maybe they don't understand the difference between a published patent application and an issued patent, and they say, oh, well, this is patented. Um, I, don't wanna, I don't wanna do this. Or maybe they do understand the difference between a pending application and an issued patent, and they say, well, you know, we don't know what's gonna issue from this uh, patent, so from this patent application, so you know, maybe let's not do go into this field. Maybe let's not do this, and that's a good deterrent as well. So when it comes to offensive protection, patent pat, issued patents give you the ability to exclude others from making, using, selling, offering to sell, or importing the claim device within the jurisdiction of the patent. So say if it's a U.S. patent, they cannot use, make, sell, import that thing into the United States or in the jurisdiction of the United States. It, it, you have to have foreign patents in uh, foreign jurisdictions specifically in order to stop uh, stuff going on in those uh, other jurisdictions. So th that's going to be the offensive uh, protection of patents. And keep in mind that it's an exclusionary right or it's a negative right. You don't actually get the right to do anything. You get the right to exclude other people from doing things. And here's a, a good example of that. So for instance, you could go get a patent on uh, using a drug to treat cancer. Um, but at the same time, you wouldn't actually necessarily be able to use that drug to treat cancer. You're going to need FDA approval. You're going to have to go through you know, FDA screening and go through clinical trials and things like that in order to actually have authorization to do that. You could, yes, still, you could stop other people from making, using, selling, offering to sell whatever sort of uh, product or process you have patented, but you don't get the right to actually do those things. So that is the exclusionary right of patents that gives you protection for your ideas and inventions. So if you got some value out of this video, give it a thumbs up, I'd really appreciate it. And if you want more on uh, protecting ideas and inventions and on startups, sort of the insider stuff that I work with my clients on on a daily basis, be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit that little bell 
bell icon so you don't miss any important patent videos. And I'd like to know uh, what you think about this in the comments. Do you di disagree with stuff? Do you agree with stuff? Have you ever done any of these things? Have you ever accidentally uh, forfeited patent rights unknowingly um, by making public disclosures, public use, or offers for sale? I'd love to hear your comments down below. And yeah, we'll see you again in the next video. Thanks for watching.